Hello and thank you for watching. My name is Don Eindhoven and I am the founder of the Dutch Cyber Warfare Community. You are watching clips recorded from our 22nd Roundtable event held on December 3rd, 2020. We call it the Corona Edition. Our next speaker is Richard Thiem. Richard is a much-loved professional public speaker and author who is known as the grandfather of hackers. While this probably also has a lot to do with his open and friendly demeanor, it is certainly very much based on his insightfulness on the impact of technology on society. With his slogan, Have Mouth, Will Travel, he is a well-known figure in the global security conference space. You can find him speaking on widely varying topics, such as the impact on your social life that working in the security sector can have, to research on extraterrestrial life. He's also an author whose last work, Mobius, is an all-too-realistic confessional of a spy. He's been writing for decades, and his earlier work contains jewels such as Islands in the Clickstream. His stories involving technology and society are so insightful that his work from over 25 years ago is still almost entirely relevant today. We are so pleased to have had him with us this night. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Thiem. Hackers, uh, he's an author, an Episcopal priest. He's given so many talks in so many places. I think you are the most repeated speaker at DEF CON ever, right? Or close I think so. 24 straight years at DEF CON last 24 year. 24 straight yeah. years. So uh, Jeff Moss said, you know, he, he said a lot of very positive things about Richard. He gets him, you know, we've had Jeff on in 2015 as one of the panelists uh, back then in the Cybersecurity Week. And um, uh, he's a very highly regarded. People regard you even higher. Um, the you You've written books that are 25 years old and still relevant, you know, as if it was yesterday. So, ladies Thank and gentlemen, I'll, I'll gladly give you the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Thiem. Thank you Thank very, you. very much. It's a lot of hyperbole. It's almost Trumpian in its hyperbole, but uh, not not quite. I would but love I to be U.S. president if, if there's still a position available. <laughs> well, we'll see, we'll see what we have options for going forward. Uh, I'm going to do this uh, as quickly as I can because it, uh, I do respect the time and the requirements of the time. I, I thought I would just say a few words about uh, what I've learned about uh, what it takes to be an expert in relationship to doing the work of computer security, uh, but it ports also to uh, all, all kinds of other work. Uh, long ago, uh, I watched a man in the uh, network uh, at uh, the Pentagon Security Forum uh, where I had spoken and I was being given a tour and he was using a very arcane a kind of software suite. It was one that most people didn't use, but he understood so well, uh, even its glitches, that he used it to perfection to do some serious defense work uh, on behalf of the United States through the Pentagon. And uh, we were standing at one side of the room, you know, about a dozen people all sitting at screens doing the work, and he suddenly squinted, leaned over, and went to the other side of the room and uh, checked out something on the screen. In other words, he had a granular appreciation for an anomalous deviation from what he expected to be present. And he knew what his expectations were so clearly and so well uh, that he could detect that across the room and, and check it out and act if need be on what he had seen. Uh, that's what an expert looks like. Uh, and when we tried to create expert systems, we had a lot of trouble. Uh, you remember when the first expert systems used a lot of if this, then that rules, and they attempted to capture the rules of thumb or the heuristics which uh, experts used. And the intention was to build a database of those heuristics and then allow other people by simply clicking through the database uh, to become, in effect, expert in that uh, domain of understanding. And they thought it would be that simple. So they did go to experts uh, to collect their heuristics. Word, uh, uh, it's coming to some domains like oil exploration or uh, some kinds of diagnostics. Uh, that worked very well. But for many domains that were fuzzy at the edges, they didn't work so well at all. And they found the reason they didn't work so well in so many domains was because experts didn't follow the rules. Uh, experts 
knew what the rules were because they had learned them when they were beginners, but they didn't follow them any longer because they leaped to their own collection derived from experience of meta rules, of rules that transcended the rules. Uh, they were no longer beginners. When you begin in any domain, you have to learn the rules, and the rules are black and white. Uh, they're very rigid. You are told to do exactly what the rules require. Uh, don't deviate from the rules, and those are good instructions for a beginner because you don't know uh, how to deviate or what would be the value of deviating. And so just follow those black and white binary rules. But as you grow in experience, you reach a, a middle ground. You gain an ability to be more sensitive to context and to nuance and to ambiguity and to the fuzziness, the grayness of so much of what you're dealing with, especially in, uh, in security work. And as you persist in your work, you become an expert. And as I say, the experts transcend the rules beginners learn all the time. And so there really is only one rule because the experts know when to break the rule. So the rule is, if you don't know when to break the rule, don't break the rule. But if you have achieved a level of expertise, feel free to apply your learned experience to what you face. So this is why though, when you're a beginner, and some people stay at the beginner level of black and white rigidity for their whole lives. Uh, I think Don mentioned that I, uh, been a clergyman for um, uh, 16 years, and religion is a very good place to see this. Uh, people first approach the rules of religion, whether it's ritual or rite or biblical scripture or whatever, uh, in, a, in a beginner way. And they want to know what the rules are for doing the right thing and for living the right kind of life. But as you grow in your understanding of life, you realize that that's not going to work uh, uh, f forever, because life is gray, and some decisions have to be made without full and adequate knowledge or factual base and understanding of what's involved. Uh, so they evolved in theological terms what they called situation ethics, which said your ethical response to a situation should be determined by the context, not just the explicit black and white content, but the context to which you are responded. And in fact, all ethics are situational, but a beginner doesn't know that. And this is why in religion, especially, it's easy to see if you're a rigid black and white thinker, you, you can't uh, understand why an expert is making the decisions they're making uh, because you don't see the transcendent level at which they are operating. And this is why beginners are angry at experts and why the attack on situational ethics or situational decision-making and information security uh, seemed chaotic to them because they didn't understand the logical or supra-logical uh, basis for it at all. So an expert looks like someone who's breaking the rules all the time to a beginner, but they're really not there transcending the rules. This is a situation you run into a lot uh, when you become an experienced human being. Uh, Robert Galvin used to be the head of uh, Motorola, and he had tremendous success in building that company once upon a time in, into the great institution it became, and they had a lot of breakthrough inventions. And he was asked what ideas made the difference uh, turned out to be a real breakthrough idea that created a whole new space of opportunity and possibility. And he thought about it hard and long, so don't take my word for it, take Robert Galvin's word. He said every breakthrough idea that made a real difference uh, began as an opinion of one or two. Just a few people saw it. And over time, they were laughed at if they repeated it. And then people got angry at them because they would, wouldn't just shut up and go away. But as their ideas took hold, sooner or later, everybody would say they not only always believed that, 
what they had believed it all along. He said, breakthrough ideas always sound crazy at first, which doesn't mean that the corollary is true, that all crazy ideas are breakthrough ideas. You need rational reflection and thought and experience to be brought to the ideas. But he built teams on a radical openness to never closing off the conversation because you never knew when that idea was going to pop from someone who'd been reticent to say it or afraid to say it or didn't have confidence in their own ability to see what contradicted the group think. And he said the corollary, one corollary was true, that every time everyone agreed that some problem could be solved in one specific way and the more quickly they agreed, the more sure he was, they were always wrong. And if you think about paradigm change, it explicates why they were wrong. When people are framed by a prior context and the context of our lives is determined to a huge extent by technological transformational engines. Uh, when, when people are formed by that prior context, they are kind of assimilated into a way of thinking up against which new ways of thinking will genuinely sound crazy. And so everyone will agree and laugh at the new idea. But when it's a breakthrough idea, it becomes the cornerstone of a whole new way of thinking because it is contrary to the paradigm, which has in fact already ended. And how do I know it's already ended? Because that thought, that new idea wouldn't even be thinkable unless it was foundational for a new contextual understanding. And so I am fond of saying that understand the context in which you operate because the context really is the content and turning context into content is the goal of real communication clarity and leadership. Because if you can't turn the new context into a content you can articulate in a way that other people get, it is never going to move the people with whom you're a part. What determines this? Your intention to learn. I'm looking at the clock ticking away. Uh, your intention to learn is everything. Intentionality and a refusal to enter, a refusal to foreclose conversation, even in your own head, about ideas until they have been examined, which piggybacks on the last talk we heard on conspiracy theories. Uh, the unexamined conspiracy theory is the one that's going to win. Uh, evaluate the content of what it is you yourself are thinking about how to approach a problem, because the very way you approach the problem may not be if conditions are changing rapidly and radically the right approach. And I do think conditions are changing rapidly and radically, because when I first start writing and talking about the computer revolution and what it would bring, and that was in the late 80s and early 90s, people thought I was crazy. But everything that I articulated has turned out to be absolutely true, and it has created the platform for every other domain of understanding and expertise to be radically altered at a speed of change, which is faster and faster as well, which is one of the reasons we are so right for conspiracy theories. When everything is changing out from under us, and the ground is changing right under our feet, we look for some coherent, control mechanism and an idea that seems to explain everything, however obviously wrong it is, just we glom onto it. We have evolved to believe things, which apparently works over time for the species, but it's not working very well in the democratic context of the United States right now. So examine your assumptions and grow in your level of expertise and in your ability to articulate for others why the point of view you are espousing is applicable to the complex, ambiguous situation, which is always going to be full of anomalous data that needs to be either just discarded wholesale or you need to pay attention to it and ask if it's suggesting that you are missing something. Okay, I'm sure that's plenty of time, so um, I haven't mm -hmm. been following the uh, Q&A, are there any questions? And I, I will add, I, I have to add, I just finished my best book ever, 
It will be published soon, ideally at the end of this month. It is called Mobius, a memoir. It is about an intelligence professional reflecting on his entire career and why it went in the direction it went. And it is based on my having worked for 27 years very intimately and closely with people in the intelligence community and the security community. Um, and I finally decided it was time as a senior officer at NSA said to me long ago, Richard, based on what you've learned here, you can't ever tell the truth unless you write fiction. So this book is fiction, but there you are. But not really. <laughs> yeah. Not, not really. No, it's, 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 it's complex and it's the best thing I've ever written. On to the next book. Thank God for COVID. Kept me at the computer, <laughs> right? I, I, I know I know so many people that have said I've never been so productive when it comes to writing because right. there's nothing else to do. <laughs> right. It's true. Well, I remember you telling me this story about the NSA guy talking to you about this a couple of years ago, quite a bit of years actually already. Yeah. Um, I, I really, I mean, there's countless of questions. Um, I really wish we could go into them, but we need to move on to the last speaker because we're running out of the time frame. Okay. Um, just share my, uh, my website has contact information and an email link and it's themeworks.com. And if anybody has questions, ping me, text, uh, email, what, whatever works. I'd be glad to engage with you, uh, because I miss you. I, I am so sorry. I couldn't be back in the Netherlands, my second home which I love deeply uh, because it's so refreshing to be back in a democracy. So <laughs> carry on. Thank someone you. recently, um, someone recently uh, mentioned that a, re um, a, um, um, a republic is the opposite of a democracy. And they actually had a very good, solid, logical basis for that. And I was dumbfounded, like, wow, this is new <laughs> shit. This is new well, to me. Yeah, democracy is a, a moving target as a concept. It, it means what we choose it to mean at the time. Well, um, uh, looking at the content of what you just spoke about, it, it really um, made me harken back to, uh, I don't, what was it, 2011 or something like that when we met in, 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 in Miami? Uh, you were doing pretty much the same kind of narrative about concepts and language and how we rotate them in our mind and how we can define it and that makes it workable. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody is as floored as I am. Uh, when I was back then. Um, so I would just like to thank you, Richard, for being here. Uh, really you. great to see you again. Um, stay in good health. Give, give my regards to your wife, and I hope you're sticking around so people can send you their questions. I will. I love you, my brother. Thank you for thank sitting you, my with brother. Me. Likewise. I love you, too. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I can't ask for applause, but I'm sure you would have otherwise. Richard, theme, thank you.